Hello students, looking at current affairs for 21st June, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 20, we'll look at them in detail. The first one, Kerala offers to send 20 lakh litres of water to Tamil Nadu by rail. So Tamil Nadu Chief Minister Edappi K. Palani Swami is said to be taking a decision on Kerala's offer to supply 20 lakh litres of drinking water by train from Thiruvananthapuram to Chennai. So there is water crisis in Chennai and to take care of that Kerala has offered this help. But then Kerala Chief Minister on uh, Chief Minister's office on his Facebook page has stated that Tamil Nadu has this declined its help to supply water on a one-time basis. So opposition leaders in Tamil Nadu and the MK president also they criticized the Tamil Nadu government for rejecting the help of a neighboring state and urged that the water be accepted. So now the news comes that Tamil Nadu Chief Minister will take a decision on it. So it is said that there has been deficient rainfall and despite this storage in Kerala's reservoirs is much better than in Tamil Nadu and it has offered help. So this is a good example of interstate waters, how neighboring states can share water and tide over crisis in neighboring region. Then this is President bats for simultaneous polls. So President Ramnath Kovin has asked MPs to seriously ponder over the proposal of simultaneous elections. So he stated about simultaneous elections during the presidential address, which, is a, which was an hour-long address to joint sitting of both houses of parliament. So both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha joint sitting takes place and the president addresses it. So this happens every year and at the commencement of a new Lok Sabha too. So this is the presidential address and you should know whatever is stated by the president in such an address is not he himself stating it but is, it is what the government wants him to say. So even when we have had assertive president like uh, APJ Abdul Kalam and he also wanted to say something on his own, he cannot, he cannot change the speech. It is to be stated what the government has asked him to say. say. So that is what a post of president is. It is ceremonial. It does not have any assertiveness of its own in certain criteria. Though in some cases, of course, presidential role becomes important. So this you should know that he addresses joint city. And in this, President Ramnath Kovind who spoke about how the government plans to go ahead with the triple talaq bill, about the NRC exercise, which will be covered on a priority basis, National Register of Citizens exercise of Assam, and also he spoke of a strong, strong response to terror after the attack in Pulwama in Jammu and Kashmir. And he emphasized on one nation simultaneous election. He says this is the need of the hour which would facilitate accelerated development, thereby benefiting our countrymen. The next is Sanjeev Bhatt gets life term in custodial death case. So a court in Gujarat has sentenced dismissed IPS officer Sanjeev Bhatt to imprisonment to life imprisonment in this custodial death case of 1990. This was the time when he was additional superintendent of police in Jamnagar district of Gujarat. So at present Mr. Bhatt is actually in jail and he is in jail in a separate case. This is 1996 case in which it was it is alleged that he uh, he planted drug and falsely implicated a lawyer allegedly possessing drugs. So this was when he was superintendent of police. So in 1996. So in the background, you should know about Sanjeev Bhatt. He was the officer who filed an affidavit in Supreme Court in 2011, speaking of the role of then Gujarat Chief Minister Narendra Modi in the 2002 Gujarat riots. So this affidavit in 2011 posts this. He has been suspended from IPS in 2011 and has been sacked by the Ministry of Home Affairs in 2015. So this is the background. He has been convicted uh, as such along with other constable and officers too. And uh, you should know about this 1990 case. Actually, uh, Sanjeev Bhatt, he, as an IPS officer, additional superintendent of police in the region, he had detained around 150 people because of the communal riots which had uh, cropped in the region after a bandh call against the halting of veterans BJP leader L. K. Adwani's Rath Yadra for construction of Ram Temple in Ayodhya. So when this uh, halting of him took place, the month call against the halting of uh, his Rath Yatra, so this resulted in communal riots during the month and he had detained 150 people and of these arrested, one person died in hospital after his release by the police. So his brother alleged that he was, he was tortured by the police and in this case now he has been custodial death case, he has been indicted. So he has he actually prosecution against him has been delayed for a huge number of years because of state government not giving nod for his prosecution. 
So state government did not give the nod for prosecuting him. It was given permission. It gave permission later. So for officers, government has to give a permission for uh, you know, prosecution against him. So this is the case. And in September 2018 itself, he was arrested in this drug case of 1996, which is under trial, and he has he is in jail and denied bail. So this is the whole background. And regarding the 2011 incident, post which all these cases have cropped up, so you can see it is in 2011 that an affidavit was filed by him in the Supreme Court. Post this against Narendra Modi, and post that such cases have been initiated against him. So he, what he said in his affidavit in the Supreme Court is that he was part of the meeting called by then Gujarat Chief Minister Narendra Modi following the Gujarat Godhra train accident train attack case. So in this Godhra train attack case, which was a trigger to Gujarat riots, you should know about this when Hindu pilgrims were charged to death. So after this Godhra train attack case, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi called a meeting and Sanjeev Bhatt claims that in this meeting, Mr. Modi asked the administration to allow the majority community to vent their anger against the minority community. So this is the allegation which he levels, but then the special investigation team, SIT, which was formed by the court on this uh, on this Gujarat riots, which was headed by former CBI director R.K. Raghavan, it rejected Sanjeev Bhatt's allegations and uh, said that he did not agree to the complicity of Mr. Narendra Modi in the riots. So this is regarding the Godhra train carnage case too, you should know about it. It was in 2002 that 59 people died in fire inside Sabarmati Express train near Godhra station in Gujarat. So after that, if you have seen special court has been uh, uh, has been appointed in this special investigation team and it acquitted 93 people and convicted 31. There was death sentence announced for 11 people and life imprisonment to 20 others. So appeals have been there in against this uh, SIT court in Gujarat High Court which uh, where the conviction was challenged. And uh, you can see Supreme Court has stayed trial for five years on a petition filed by National Human Rights Commission. So Supreme Court has later ordered uh, special investigation to invest investigation team to further investigate into the matter. Nanavati Commission was actually set up and this commission concluded that a fire in the coach S6 of the Sabarmati train near uh, Sabarmati Express near Godhra station, it was not an accident. It was uh, the coach was set up yes. And the death sentence has later been con commuted to life imprisonment, but the conviction has happened in this Kothra train uh, attack case. And post this, you can see on Feb 27, 2002, the uh, Kothra train accident attack took place. And Feb 28, 2002, the next day itself, a mob killed 97 people at Ahmedabad's Naroda Patti. And Supreme Court set up an SIT for investigating these two. And the charge sheet was filed against 15 accused, Maya Ben Kodnani. She was arrested. She was Gujarat minister. Then she resigned as Gujarat minister. She has been called kingpin of riots by Sit Court, Special Investigation Team Court. So this is yeah. Even in this conviction has happened in April 2018, uh, the Naroda Patia case, in which uh, 13 people have been convicted, including Bajrang Dal leader Babu Bajrangi. They have been uh, convicted. So this is it. But uh, she, Maya Bing Kodnani, was acquitted in this case in 2018. So this is one of the incidents of Gujarat riots. Such incidents took place all across the state and thousands of people lost their lives, especially from the minority community. So this was response to Godhra train attack case. The next is one killed in firing as violence continues in West Bengal. So at least one person has been reportedly killed and several others injured in firing at Bhatpara Kakinara area of North 24 Parganas, about 30 km from Kolkata in West Bengal. So here, after a two hour clash, the police reached the region and uh, it is said that the that these people had attacked uh, these people who have been uh, injured. One person has been killed. They were attacked by the locals and vehicles were vandalized. So in the area, there have been such incidents of violence in West Bengal. And this area, you should know, has been predominantly inhabited by migrant workers from Bihar, Jharkhand, and UP. And this region has witnessed sporadic violence following the election results. So election result in this region saw BJP leader Arjun Singh defeating Trinamul Congress leader, the candidate, Dinesh Trivedi. So of course, that there have been um, such violent cases in the region. Then next is India's first solar cruise vessel to be rolled out soon. 
so this is aditya already which has been you know launched in 2016 which has been successful aditya is actually a solar powered ferry so this is india's first solar powered ferry in which was launched in 2016 by kerala kerala state water transport department so this has been quite successful so now kerala is launching country's first solar powered cruise boat which will be launched by december 2019 so it's a 3 crore project and this boat is under construction will be able to carry around 100 passengers so it will be a hybrid vehicle means it will run on solar power will also have a battery so it will have a, a solar panels battery and a generator too so this is launch uh, aditya has been quite successful a project the solar powered ferry so it is said that aditya incurs a rock bottom energy expense of rupees 200 a day compared to diesel powered ferries which uh, incur a cost of rupees 8000 per day and solar vessels also do not create air and noise pollution which diesel powered ferries do so this is regarding aditya india's first solar ferry then next is polavaram project will be completed in 2021 so this is polavaram multi purpose project which has been launched it is actually a river water connection project it connects rivers godavari and krishna and uh, it was a uh, it was a major project under former andhra pradesh chief minister chandrababu naidu and now andhra pradesh has seen landslide victory in the assembly elections which took place simultaneously with lok sabha elections a landslide victory for vysr congress so andhra pradesh new chief minister is vys jagmohan reddy and he visited the site and the officials here stated that the project could be completed not in 2020 as expected but by june 2021 so he has asked the officials to go ahead with the project and you should know that the former tdp government was uh, planning to have this project completed and said that the them site uh, project by gravity the water will be sent to the canals of the project by gravity in the year 2019 itself but presently the dates which come are of june 2021 it said this will not be possible also the river linking project results in submergence of certain regions and in because of this submergence what is required is rehabilitation of the population in the region so this is regarding the polavaram dam so we will see another image too so here you can see this is the image it is connecting river godavari and krishna so this is a polavaram canal 174 km long canal so it will it is actually proposing to provide excess water from godavari river to krishna river so it is going to benefit these regions here so actually what is the concern is the submergence which would take place because of this canal being formed and here you can see the area of submergence is shown and this includes region even in chatisgarh and orissa the joining states of karnataka so andhra pradesh it is alleged did not conduct public hearing in chatisgarh and orissa area which would also be affected despite instructions to do so and it has begun construction of the project then next is nhrc questions frailty of health infrastructure so national human rights commission has issued notices to the union government and that is union health and family welfare ministry and all state and union territories over what it terms as deplorable public health infrastructure in the country so it has taken so much of cognizance of several media reports recently bihar's muzaffarpur district is seeing acute encephalitis syndrome cases recently in which more than 100 children have died and also earlier it speaks of in 2017 how the children lost their lives in gorakhpur in uttar pradesh due to failure of oxygen supply so this had also prominently been in news so in this context now national human rights commission has highlighted that how right to life is a fundamental right under article 21 of the constitution and the citizens in the country have been denied children in the country have been denied right to life and states have failed central and states have failed so it also refers to widespread malnutrition prevalent in several states and it's also observed that under article 47 of the constitution which is a part of directive principle of state policy the constitution says that states should work to raise the level of nutrition and standard of living of its people but it says the states have failed in this as well so this is nhrc which has asked the center and states to respond to its notices now so you should know about nhrc it was established in 1993 its statute is 
contained to, actually it was established through an ordinance to confirm with the paris principles the international principles later an act was also there brought in place and this is protection of human rights act of 1993 which has been amended later too. so this is nhrc for protection and promotion of human rights it comprises of a chairperson who should be a retired chief justice of india one member who is or has been judge of supreme court one member who is or has been chief justice of a high court then two members with personal uh, practical experience or knowledge of uh, matters related to human rights and also there are ex officio members that are the uh, national commission heads of four national commissions the chairpersons of national commission for minorities national commission for sc national commission for st and national commission for women so these four chairpersons of national commissions are ex officio members of nhrs because the matter related to them are related to human rights and this this is the list of functions of the national human rights commission you should know about it it, it can inquire suo moto or on a petition suo moto means on its own nobody is petitioning before it, but it has taken up the case on its own that is called suo moto that can happen with nhrc too that this term we will come across even with respect to courts the courts can also take up a case suo moto and this is regarding the paris principle so the paris principle defines human rights institutions rules so these paris principles define human rights institutions rules which india also had to comply so it established the national human rights commission so you can see it should examine legislation and administrative provisions in the country look into any situation of violation of human rights prepare report on national situation related to human rights and draw attention of the government on human rights violations the next is pakistan told to go beyond cosmetic steps so india it has said is not impressed with the cosmetic and literal steps which pakistan is taking so it has said that comprehensive steps are required to counter terror already bilateral talks between india and pakistan have been stalled because of terror attacks from pakistan starting with the 2016 pathan court attack so india pakistan comprehensive bilateral dialogue has already been derailed and after the election of new government it was it was said in pakistani media that prime minister narendra modi has sent a letter to prime minister imran khan of pakistan for uh, expressing desire to hold talks but it has been rejected by india no such offer has been made so the bilateral dialogue has been stalled while you should also know that at the same time still both sides india and pakistan are in, are in contact regarding building of kartarpur corridor project so what is this kartarpur corridor project it has been prominently in news you should know about it it is a corridor connecting india and pakistan it's a 4 km long corridor approximately connecting uh, dera baba nanak in india to kartarpur sahib in uh, pakistan across the river kaveri you can see so this is approximately 6 km 2 km in india and 4 km in pakistan corridor so kartarpur sahib corridor is uh, is uh, scheduled to be completed by 2019 end because it is uh, guru nanak's 250th birth anniversary and uh, her kartarpur sahib is associated with guru nanak so this corridor will be facilitating pilgrims from india Then next is U.S. report cites Bihar shelter home abuse case. So this is regarding Muzaffarpur shelter abuse case in which 34 minor girls in Bihar were, uh, you know, uh, were abused as such, and uh, this is this was a government-run shelter home. So in Bihar, so this case also came forth in news prominently because of this study, Tata Institute of Social Science study. So this case has been mentioned by U.S. State Department in its trafficking in persons report. so us state department develop, prepares this report on trafficking in persons globally so it uh, cites india also it has criticized india for systemic failure to address forced labor also and says that sexual trafficking sex trafficking in government run and government funded shelter homes is a serious problem in india so india is being put in the tier 2 category by us report it is in this category with countries like pakistan nepal nigeria and singapore So these tier two country means countries where governments do not fully meet the minimum standards of Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 of USA, but they are making significant efforts to bring themselves in compliance with those standards. So this is it. So US speaks on for the world as such, categorizes nations under this on all aspects. So this is with respect to trafficking. It says though the government has officially abolished bonded labor, so it talks of sex trafficking also. 
with this Mazafarpur shelter abuse case being cited. It also talks of bonded labor. It says India bonded labor has been abolished in 1976, but the system still exists. So it says there's one scheme prevalent in granite quarries in India where quarry owner offers wage advances or loans with exorbitant interest rates and traps workers in debt bondage. So this is bonded labor which is taking place in India even in today's times. So this is regarding the Muzaffarpur case. CBI carried out forensic examination of the house and the statements of the victim have been used to develop the timeline to prosecute the accused as such too. This is it. So, such sexual, mental, and physical abuse is rampant in a large number of shelter homes and short stay homes in the country. Not just girls are molested, but even boys in some shelter homes have reported sexual abuse. It is said some underage girls were found to be pregnant also, some staying with babies. And this is regarding the state of childcare homes in the country. So, this is Ministry of Women and Child Development survey in which it has said that adequate care given per child number of uh, child care homes which provide adequate care are only 46.7 percent fir filed by homes on missing children efforts to trace children's parents only 19.3 percent of the cases efforts are made home reporting homes reporting restoration of children so that is weird. and this is regarding bonded labor too so india's modern day slaves it is said there are thousands of people in india who live as bonded laborers even today they said over 3 lakh people were identified as such by the government in 2016. So, a person is bound to repay a loan through labor for an unspecified period of time. So, though bonded labor has been abolished by this bonded labor system abolition act of 1976, the practice continues still even after 4 decades. So, it's actually a loan given and to repay the loan they continue to work. So, that is what bonded labor is. These are figures given in various states you can see. In Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Odisha, Andhra, and UP, and other states. Then next is so this is Ministry of Labor and Employment report. Then next is changes to Information Technology Act to take effect soon. So government will soon notify amendments to Information Technology Act that will make it mandatory for online platforms such as WhatsApp, Facebook, and Twitter to trace the originator of unlawful content. So, the draft rules had been published and they are going to be finalized now. The draft rules came in 2018 December and the draft rules proposed to remove unlawful content within 24 hours from the platform. So, there is criticism from the opposition and some experts over fears of surveillance and censorship because of such provisions. But then government points out there are a number of lynching cases which occurred in 2018 and all these occurred mostly due to fake news being circulated on social media sites. So, social media has brought in new challenges for law enforcement agencies because there are inducements for recruitment of terrorists taking place through social media. There is circulation of obscene content. There is spread of disharmony and incitement to violence which takes place. So, to address this, the government feels that there is a need for amendment to Information Technology Act on such unlawful content. So, what are the amended rules proposing is given here. Companies have to trace and report origin of message within 72 hours of receiving a complaint from law enforcement agency. It will have to disable access within 24 hours of to content deemed defamatory or against national security. And such info and associated records will have to be preserved for 180 days. Platforms with more than 5 million users must have registered entity in India under company Act. So all such other provisions and they say they will have a nodal officer in India to deal with law enforcement agencies on a 24-7 basis. And companies also must send communication to users once a month about their privacy policies. And platforms must deploy tools to identify and remove or disable public access to unlawful information or content. So such were the provisions in the draft rules to amend, amend the Information Technology Act 2009, uh, as such, 2000 which will be now amended. So that's the news. The next is Navy to build six submarines. So the Navy has issued an expression of interest for shortlisting potential strategic partners for construction of six P-75I submarines. So project 75 is already going on. Now this is project 75I. So these submarines are to be constructed under strategic partnership model, make in India and defense. 
So this is the second project being undertaken under the latest strategic partnership model. In the first one, first project under this model is the procurement of 111 naval utility helicopters. So we'll see about that too. Presently, an expression of interest has been issued by the Navy. So this project of P75I will cost nearly 45,000 crore rupees. So an expression of interest for shortlisting original equipment manufacturers will also be issued. So this is strategic partnership model means there is there are these foreign manufacturers who will be partnering with an Indian strategic partner. So strategic partners will an expression of interest from them has been called for now. So they will have a have a partnership with these OEMs later. So, strategic partners have been mandated to set up dedicated manufacturing lines for these P-75I, 6 P-75I submarines in India with the aim to make India the global hub for submarine design and production. So, all six submarines under the project will be built in India by the selected Indian strategic partner in collaboration with the selected original equipment manufacturer. So, that's the idea. So, the potential strategic partners are expected to respond to this expression of interest of the Navy within two months. So this is regarding the strategic partnership model. Uh, the policy is intended to promote Indian private sector participation in defense manufacturing. It came into effect in May 2017. There are four segments which have been identified for acquisition under the strategic partnership policy as we just discussed was regarding the submarines. There are also these naval utility helicopters as we saw. So for helicopters, submarines, fighter aircraft and armored, armored fighting vehicles or main battle tanks. So these are the four segments identified under strategic partnership policy. So here you can see it enables participation of private Indian firms in making India and defense. And the policy acknowledges Indian private sector's limited experience in defense manufacturing. That's why it would be in collaboration with original equipment manufacturers. So here you can see regarding naval utility helicopters also. The detail is given. And this is regarding project 75I submarines. Government acceptance of necessity happened in November 2007 and now expression of interest is happening in 2019 you can see. So this you can see is further detail regarding the submarines which we have. Project 75 has already been undergoing. We have uh, we are procuring six Scorpion submarines from France. So they have also been delayed but it is being done you can see. You can see granted acceptance project 75 like granted acceptance of necessity in November 2017 but tender yet to be issued. So now expression of interest has been issued. You can see these are num the number of submarines which India already has and project 75 under which six scorpion submarines are being procured. The first one is INS Kalvari, INS Khanderi, INS Karan are the names of some of these submarines. Of the, uh, of the six submarines of them, these are the three names. Then next is Iran made a very big mistake by shooting down U.S. drone. So U.S. President Donald Trump has said that Iran made a very big mistake because a U.S. military drone was shot down by Iran, and Iran says that it was on a spy mission over its territory. So this U.S. drone, you know, in an incident uh, has been sh shot down, which has fanned fears of wider military conflict in West Asia now. Already, USA has alleged that Iran has attacked tankers in the region, which USA, which Iran has actually denied. But in this case, it has accepted that it's spy, it was this uh, drone was on a spy mission on its territory. So, it's escalation of tensions now seen in the Gulf region. It has been escalating since mid-May, including explosive strikes on six oil tankers overall. So here is the region, the Gulf, the state of Hormuz shown here. Iran lies here. So, you can see. so since April 2019, you know, Washington started off declaring. Uh, Washington actually it started off by Washington uh, or means USA withdrawing from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. So when it opted out in 2018, the tensions uh, escalated because it brought in sanctions against Iran and urged other nations also to impose sanctions. So it, it, April 2019, Washington declared. Uh, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, an important part of Iranian army as a terrorist group. Then in May, uh, US National Security Advisor said that it is an aircraft carrier and bomber task force to West Asia. 
then Iran, because of the sanctions, it has said that it will also opt out of the Iran nuclear deal. It does not stand anymore. The other signatories, European nations as such, which are also signatories to the deal, including even China and Russia, it is seen that they are not able to uphold their part of the deal now because of US pressure. So Iran also said that it will uh, start enriching Iran. So that was also a concern. And then such incidents of tankers being attacked and now a drone being attacked in the region. It shows escalating tensions. Then next is UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia were unlawful. Rules court. So this is a court in Britain which has ruled that UK's arms sales to Saudi Arabia might, which are, are unlawful because they might have been used in Yemen's war. So the war which Saudi Arabia is fighting in Yemen, where a huge amount of civil human rights violations are taking place. So that is why the Britain sold arms to Saudi Arabia without you know, being clear on the risk that the weapon could be uh, risk that the weapon could be operated in violation of human rights legislation. So it is not allowed in US in UK, but still it went ahead with this. So that's why the court has ruled that from now on you can see government uh, cannot sell arms to Saudi Arabia. But then the present, this is, the court's decision does not mean Britain must immediately halt arms exports to Saudi Arabia, but there is a stay on granting of new export licenses to sell arms to Saudi Arabia, which is Britain's biggest weapons purchaser. So the process of decision making by the government has been called wrong in law by the British court. It says government made no concluded assessment of whether Saudi-led coalition had committed violations of international humanitarian law in the past year during the Yemen conflict. So that is why it has ruled this uh, decision unlawful. Britain, you should know, it's world's sixth largest seller of arms after US, Russia, France, Germany, and China. And Saudi Arabia accounts for 43% of Britain's global arms sales in the past decade. The next is China confirms that it hosted Taliban leader Mullah Baradar. So this is Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, who is Taliban leader. China has confirmed that it hosted him in its initiative to expand its role in Afghanistan. So it wants uh, Taliban and Afghan to have talks. Uh, talks are already going on under USA. The dialogue you know, took place ahead of this seventh round of talks between Taliban and US, which is taking place, which is take place in Doha, in Qatar. So China also had talks with Taliban leader and the foreign ministry spokesperson of China said that Chinese officials exchanged views with him and his aides on peace and reconciliation process, as well as the fight against terrorism. So it is China has stepped up its engagement in Afghanistan because if USA leaves, you know, militarily leaves Afghanistan, then it will result in a power vacuum in the region, which could trigger outflow of militants from Afghanistan even into China in its uh, unrest region of unrest, that is the Jinyan, Jinyan region, where East Turkestan Islamic movement is going on. So the terrorists here, militants could flow into uh, China. So that is why it is escalating its uh, role in resolving the Afghan issue. China needs a peaceful Afghanistan even to draw Afghan, in, Afghan into Belt and Road Initiative to connect Asia to the Central Asian region. So Afghanistan is Asia's gateway to Central Asia, India's gateway. So also it has already announced that China-Pakistan economic corridor has been extended to Afghanistan. So it has its interest in Afghanistan and it wants peace in the region and is trying to promote dialogue between Taliban and the Afghan government. The Afghan government led by President Ashraf Ghani. The next is council may reconsider, may consider GST cut on electric vehicles. So GST council meeting is going to take place. This will be the first meeting of GST council under a new finance minister that is Nirmala Sitharaman. So this meeting is scheduled for 21st June 2019 and it is expected that there may be a rate cut for electric vehicles. The GST rate on electric vehicles is 12% currently. It may be brought down to 5%. Also, what is expected is extension of the term of National Anti-Profiteering Authority till November 2020. Also, tax experts say that the GST Council's real focus should be on addressing concerns regarding the new tax filing system recently introduced. So, annual tax filing also has to be filed. So, there is this GSTR 9 form, which is to be annual return filing form, which has to be filled. The due date for it is June 30. So this is the first annual return that tax filers, filers will be filing for GST. So discussions must focus on this also promoting and you know, it's a very complex returns form and a lot of detailed information is required. 
so that is why this issue also has to be discussed by gst council and also on the input tax credit issue so input tax credit refund system has to be streamlined further because large portion of working capital is locked away especially for startup um, uh, startup companies so when they don't get the input tax credit what is input tax credit also you should know we'll discuss all this so here the key words basically are gst council national anti profiteering authority input tax credit and gstr9 gstr9 we discuss is the first annual return it's actually an annual returns form and it's the first one for gst so far so it has due date is june to june 30 2019 and you should know about gst council its composition it comprises of finance minister as its chairman earlier it was arun jetli now it will be nirmala sitaraman and then there are union ministers of state for finance and revenue also represented plus minister of finance from uh, or any other minister nominated by each state so the voting power which is there in gst council one third voting power is with the center and two third amongst the states the minimum quorum for the gst council proceedings to take place is 50% members and each decision must have approval of three fourth members of the council and regarding national anti profiteering authority it has been established in november 2017 through uh, the cabinet decision so it uh, you can see it talks of this national anti profiteering authority with a chairman and technical members uh, so it will be an authority under gst so its mandate is to ensure that benefits of reduction in gst rates on goods and services are passed on to the ultimate consumers by way of reduction in prices so anti profiteering measures are enshrined in gst law it is an institutional me mechanism to ensure that full benefits of input tax credit and re reduce gst rates on supply of goods and services flow to consumers if not then there are punishments what is this input tax credit is also important you should understand it so basically gst is a value added tax so tax which is paid by the entire supply chain so that has to be refunded by the government so only on value addition tax has to be imposed but payment is there on overall so overall tax paid on you know purchase of x so is rupees 100 so tax paid on purchase of y is rupees 120 so what happens is all this is input for this particular output so you can see tax paid on purchase of z is rupees 80 so all x y z is being used to produce a product which is an output so inputs are all these three raw materials for example in whatever way they are so it can be any good or service so already they have paid tax rupees 100 120 and 80 respectively and on this output again a tax is imposed on the overall output that is of rupees 450 so here you can see tax to be paid is uh, rupees 450 is been paid but then there is an input tax credit which is the addition of these three so 100 plus 120 plus 80 because this much tax has already been paid so this all adds up to 300 so though it has paid 450 net tax which it has to pay is 450 minus 300 means 150 so net tax to be paid is 150 so it has to get 300 refund so that is what input tax credit is so that has to be credited to this manufacturer so that is the how the gst system works so it's an integrated system so what happens is every member in the supply chain is part of the gst system which is a which is a computerized system so all these files are all these forms are filed the annual returns and the monthly returns as such also quarterly returns are filed online so then matching tallying takes place so they cannot have a mismatch so that is why this will ensure that there is complete compliance and in for that matter there is the system of value added tax so input tax credit is also an integrated part of the system so you should understand this then next is manual checks of igsc returns only for risky exporters center so the government has clarified that manual checks because as i said it is computerized but manual checks can also take place so this will be for integrated gst what is integrated gst you should understand so taxation under gst is two one is on intrastate within the state whatever goods are moving and uh, and services are moving and interstate so intrastate movement there is central gst and state gst imposed and for interstate movement there is integrated gst so this is what we are talking of integrated gst so on integrated gst government has clarified that manual checks would take place but this will be only for risky exporters so this means those who are suspected to be indulging in large scale frauds related to integrated gst refunds so input tax credit refunds are given but they indulge in frauds so for such risky exporters manual checks would be done 
and they say that such risky exporters account for only 3.5% of the total number of exporters. So in number, they are around, you can see, 5,106, so that is 3.5%. So you can see the, what would be done is their availment of input tax credit would be verified. So you can see it does not mean that they would not be allowed to export. Exports would be allowed immediately, only their refund would be, uh, you know, pending means it would be released when the refund would be released itc would be released only after verification within 30 days so input tax credit would be verified and then they would get refund on what they claim the next is ncrt puts jet resolution plan on fast track so this is national company law tribunal which has taken up the jet airways resolution and it has set in motion the process of expeditiously finding a solution for revival of jet airways so companies share prices surged by over 150% after this news. So actually a petition has been filed in NCLT by State Bank of India led lenders. So they want to recover their dues which amount to around 8,000 crore rupees. So insolvency resolution personnel have already been asked to take over all assets of Jet Airways immediately and have been directed to file their resolution plan. So there is this insolvency resolution personnel who is appointed. So he has to file the resolution plan within three months considering the number of workers and the fact that the case is of national importance. So Jet Airways actually has reported being declared bankrupt also by a court in Netherlands. But then the NCLT has dismissed such a plea saying that Jet Airways is a company registered in India. So Netherlands does not have jurisdiction on Jet Airways. It's a Mumbai based company. So it is as this the declaration of bankrupt by court in Netherlands happened because of application by two service providers to Jet Airways which claimed that they had unpaid bills of worth rupees 280 crore rupees. So they will also be looked into in the present case before NCLT. So you should know about the insolvency and bankruptcy code. It calls for resolution of such stressed assets in a speedy manner, revival of company if possible. So you can see there are such uh, entities which are part of this. Like there are two distinct resolution processes, uh, press start or insolvency resolution. And uh, adjudication takes place by NCLT, National Company Law Tribunal, in case of companies and debt recovery tribunal in terms of, in case of individuals. Then there is Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, which is the regulatory body under IBC, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. There are IPs, that is Insolvency Professionals, to handle commercial aspect of insol insolvency resolution process. And then there are Insolvency Professional Agencies also. So this is what we are talking about, Insolvency Resolution Personnel, Professionals. And there are Information Utilities also involved to process the financial information to be used in insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings. So all these are part of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of 2016. Then next is SEBI sets up panel to review margins on derivatives. So uh, Security and Exchange Board of India has uh, got feedback that the existing margin requirements in the derivative segment is pushing up the cost of trading. So it is not managing the risk in the most efficient manner. That's why SEBI has decided to review the current framework of margins in futures and options segment. So what is this margin requirement you should understand in stocks, in futures and options it has been stated. So margin trading means we uh, an investor borrows money from a broker to invest in stocks. So it increases the borrowing power of the investor. So it allows the investor to buy more than normal stocks which he can actually purchase. So there are there is this margin trading which takes place. So in this margin trading, the, amount, the margin requirement as such is said to be high. So cost of trading is high. So lower cost of trading was the primary reason it is said by Nifty contracts were being preferred to be traded on Singapore exchange rather than on National Stock Exchange NSE itself. So in February 2018, actually three Indian stock exchanges, BSC, NSC and Metropolitan Stock Exchange took up a joint initiative to stop trading of derivative contracts based on Indian indices in overseas bourses. But the reason why they were being traded there is lower cost of trading, lower margin requirements. That is why now a committee has been established on this issue by uh, CB. So you can see trading in derivatives in India costs much more when compared with most of the other leading markets due to variety of margins that are imposed on the traders. This is Singapore exchange. So Nifty futures turnover in India and Singapore is compared, you can see. So Singapore is also quite high. The next is Himalayan glaciers are melting twice as fast since 2000. 
so this is a study which has been undertaken where data has been compared of data has been compared of the data of two data has been compared one is cold war era spy satellite data which is showing data of ice mass in 1975 cold war 1970s which was a height of the cold war when us had deployed these spy satellites that orbited the globe and took thousands of photographs using telescopic camera system for reconnaissance purposes so this data and now four decades later data has been compared so modern stereo satellites data has been used now four decades later to show the same images comparing the same images so this is showing the devastating impact of warming of earth on the himalayan glaciers so uh, you know ice loss for 650 of the largest glaciers across 2000 km transect across himalayas has been compared and it says total ice mass uh, loss uh, you know as such present in uh, total ice mass present in 1975 was 87 percent uh, of that 87 percent of the total ice mass present in 1975 87 percent remained in 2000 and 72 percent remained in 2016 means in 2016 28 percent has been lost and the study asserts that this is because of rising temperatures that accelerating loss is taking place not because of other reasons like changing precipitation patterns or deposition of soot on snow etc then next is japan's washi paper torn by modern life so washi paper which is japan's ultra thin paper it has been used for variety of purposes in japan like for writing painting up to lampshades umbrellas sliding doors etc it has 1300 year history and it is a unesco intangible cultural heritage as such too but now it is struggling to attract consumers and its market value has dropped by more than 50 percent in the past two decades it's called the world's thinnest paper washi paper it is, has helped to even save historical documents at major museums and libraries too so it's more flexible and durable the traditional handmade paper is manufactured from plants called kozo or mulberry so it has fibers that are much longer than materials used for paper in the west such as wood and cotton so this is the washi paper shown here world's thinnest paper and the last news is world health organization writes new prescription to prevent misuse of antibiotics so this is world health organization's prescription to combat the growing menace of antibiotic abuse and antibiotic resistance worldwide it has suggested adoption of access watch and reserve so this should be the approach in which uh, access basically means you can see that is detailed out here access means antibiotics should be these antibiotics should be available at all times watch means these antibiotics are recommended as first or second choice treatment for small number of infections and reserve means these antibiotics should be considered last resort option should not be easily or you know, generally used so you can see so here you can see antibiotics are you know, most common antibiotics uh, and which are used for common and uh, so it specifies which antibiotics to be used for most common and serious infections which ones should be uh, ought to be available at all times in the healthcare system and those which must be used sparingly or reserved to be used only as last resort so that is reserved so those which should be used at all times it says more than 50 percent of antibiotics in many countries are used inappropriately for treatment of viruses so antibiotics are for fighting bacterial infections they treat only bacterial infections but it said it, more than 50 percent antibiotics are used to treat viruses viral infection so that is misuse because of which antimicrobial resistance spreads so now this new campaign of world health organization is aiming to increase the proportion of global consumption of antibiotics in the access group so this should be increased antibiotics consumption in access group should be increased to at least 80 60 percent and reduce the use of antibiotics uh, most at risk of resistance so access antibiotics are narrow spectrum antibiotics means they target specific microorganisms uh, so they are lost less costly also they are available as generics also in india also health ministry has made it mandatory that uh, a five millimeter thick red vertical band should be there on packaging of prescription only drugs so it should send this is to sensitize people to be cautious while buying these medicines which are widely sold without prescriptions so such misuse of antibiotics results in antibiotic resistance so world health organization has now urged all countries to adopt excess watch and reserve guidelines to reduce the spread of microbial resistance adverse events and the costs involved so some example of these antibiotics are also given here and this is showing how antibiotic resistance occurs so there are high number of bacteria few of them are resistant to antibiotics so what happens when antibiotics are taken uh, 
means even though you have bacterial infection, the antibiotic will not work because antibiotic resistance has developed. And this has developed, resistance has developed because of misuse. So like you can see, if there are antibiotic bacteria in the system and antibiotic is taken, all bacteria are eliminated except the antibiotic resistant bacteria. So they have already got resistance. So then these are the ones remaining. So they multiply, they have space to multiply and this resistant bacteria now uh, further spread and they can also transfer their drug resistance to other bacteria. So this increases the problem. So that is why misuse of antibiotics should be stopped. So you can see these are the, some of the guidelines like only use antibiotics when prescribed by a certified health professional. Always take the full prescription even if you feel better. Don't leave it midway. Never use leftover antibiotics. Never share them and even prevent infections so, so that you don't fall sick. So that is it. So these are the news items. Thank you.